Hi everybody, it's What Up Wednesday, and I was late because I thought I touched, I clicked the button and I didn't. Uh, hello everyone, and welcome to What Up Wednesday. Good to see you, third teamers, and uh, I hope that this is going live now. Who knows? Let me know. Tell me. Can you hear me? Can you see me? These are all very important things if you're going to run a live show. Good. Oh, hi, Jim. Yes, I am live. It's good to see you. <laughs> Can you tell it's live because I make all these blunders? Yes, that should be your first cue. Oh, man. Wait. I should actually tell you what's happening today before I launch into personal stories, uh, because apparently that's what you're here for instead of uh, me. So we are we're going to get to Charlize's question from last week. She wanted to talk about raised hits from uh, in the midfield that are not dangerous. What are the rules? We're going to talk about them. And uh, I've got some great scenarios to go through. It's going to be lots of fun. We are going to talk about the phrase, a probable goal uh, that res that is deprived of, is prevented by an unintentional foul inside the circle, which results in a word of a penalty stroke. So we're going to focus on that term probable, and we're going to talk about that for a while. And uh, that's for my friend, my new friend, Lockie, from uh, from down under, as it were. And if I get to it, we're going to talk about how you can tackle legally a 3D skill, a 3D dribble. <laughs> but that's what's getting there are absolutely slim to none. Although Matt Harrison has already sent his regrets, he is again putting his little one to bed and uh, he's pretending that he can't make it. So it's probably going to go a lot faster. Okay, let's see who's on board here. Always good to see you, Neil. Yeah, new backdrop. So uh, I've been changing, reconfiguring um, the, the, the furniture that I'm using in the space because not only do I do live things but my partner partner is also doing uh recording videos for his business because it's the pandemic and uh i bought this amazing transforming table that can go f all the way from i think it's 38 inches all the way to 18 and sorry i don't know what it is in centimeters i try to flip back and forth but it's hard and so i've got this pushed up against the window i'm sitting on the transforming bench which also stretches out to that distance and then that table um, is my parents and I'm going to sell it on their behalf. So the space should be a lot more versatile. I should be able to film from all kinds of places so it's gonna look like I'm in a really big space instead of 800 square feet all the time. Cause I'm not sure if you guys are aware but winter is coming. And that means that uh, A, I'm not gonna see anybody in person. B, uh, I'm gonna be trapped in this apartment for probably six months straight. So let's make this as functional a space as possible, right? Okay, who else is there? Graham, definitely live, yes. Nick, Krakenivsky, Krakenivsky. I hope I said Krakenivsky. That's a great name. Uh, good to see you. Anita Lopez from Argentina, uh, hola. Chica, mi amiga, good to see you. There you go, Lockie's here, here in the morning. I don't even know what time it is for you. So cheers, thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Meg, you're back, the better Dudek and Dudek Jr. are trying to get on. Well, uh, awesome, good to see you. Thank you, Martin. I am feeling, I am feeling good. It's awesome. Caroline from Edinburgh, it's old. Oh, yeah, well, it's getting into fall, isn't it? So we had about a cold weather just before it got amazing last week and this weekend was terrible but it's it's actually really nice today so i'm going over to a friend's for an outdoor fire pit tomorrow uh tonight so hopefully the weather will um hold up where's gustav tim i don't know who gustav is tell me what the joke is it's probably a british thing and i have no way of comprehending it but let's try it hi simon yes the new studio this is the main room i'm very excited it's kind of nice uh, Ian, that week went fast. Good to see you again. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. And Nick is here, my very favorite. I have a lovely house. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, when you spend as much time inside as I do, it's got to be good. It's got to look good. I'm also um, a minimalist in training. Uh, as I say, I'm the local Calgary chapter 
leader on Facebook of the Calgary Minimalists. Doesn't mean anything, don't worry. Um, so uh, it's something I've been interested in for a while and it's, yeah, it's happening, it's fun. Gary is here, good to see you. Simon, nice new office, yeah. It's very official, look at my, look at my kitchen. Um, let's see, that is awesome. Alistair, you've been on holiday before the madness of the new season. So, hey, however you catch this, remember, I the replays are up immediately on Facebook. If you're missing it now, you're watching the replay. I think that's how time works. I also post it on my website and on Instagram TV and YouTube and all the places. It's a lot of work, but I love it. I love it. I love all these tech problems, even though I pretend that they're the most awful things in the world. So, and Dave, hello from the Lake District. It's very good to see you again. I hope that we're not going to talk about anything that embarrasses you about your conduct on the pitch, because that would be bad. <laughs> that was a good time last week, though. I enjoyed that very much. Okay, the chances of me spilling my tea on my white shirt are approaching 100% today. Just, just so we all have that clear. All right, let's dive into uh, the first topic. And yes, Nick, I am here for your interior design device, uh, uh, advice. I better stick to umpiring and talking about that today, though, because that's how things are going. Oh, Emma Louise. Okay, look, El was on the chat. Uh, we have a, a a third team WhatsApp chat just for my amazing beta testers who are like my favorite people in the world. And Emily says she hasn't missed one live. So she is my favorite and I have to think of a prize to give her. So if you guys have any ideas, tell me. Or if you want to send her a prize, I wouldn't be mad. Give it a shot. Okay, let's talk about our first topic. And I apologized to Charlie's off the um, uh, in private because I promised her I was going to get to it last week and then I didn't but here it is here's our first question so she wants to talk about uh, lifted ball but not a pop or aerial pass but more when someone takes a free hit or passes the ball with a hit and the lift the, the ball lifts a hip height or over everyone's heads obviously where there's evasive action it's dangerous we know that but if there's no evasive action, technically you're only allowed to lift the ball from a hit when it's a goal and on safe. It's safe and on goal. It's safely on goal. As this is poor skill, and do you report poor skill or is it blading? Uh, I think that's the word they use in the rule book. They don't actually say blading, but that's okay. They talk about forehand edge in some portions. Anyway, so we are gonna talk about the lifted hit and what we need to pay attention to when we're dealing with that. As always, let's hit up the rule book like a bunch of cool cats that we are. So 9.9 .9 is where we're looking at that and players must not intentionally raise the ball from a hit unless they're shooting a goal. So many players and coaches don't know this. They really don't. They assume that if it's not dangerous, it's not. So that being said, let's talk about when we might want to actually call this and why. Okay. If any of you, as we're going along, have your thoughts, please pipe in. Let me know in the comments. Have you seen this recently? Have you had to call this recently? Why did you call it? I want to hear from you. So. The first issue that we have with this 9.9 .9 rule is the word intentional. The word intentional is used a bunch of times in the rule book. And the biggest problem we have with that is that we're not mind readers. And it feels like we're expected to be looking into the cavernous spaces in those players' brains to understand what they have planned for the next thing that they're going to do. And we deal with this when we're meeting out uh, upgraded team penalties, when we're meeting out personal penalties or cards, and it can really get tricky. 
because a player was like, I didn't mean to miss the ball and smack that player's stick away as they were running by me. That wasn't my intention, but it just happened. And they're probably right, but we're still gonna card them for that because what they did, they did so with a recklessness that they figured that if it was a foul, that was still a better result than them not trying at all, but it broke down the play. So that's one of those contexts in which the word intentional isn't applied in the strict English sense as we understand the dictionary definition of the word. It's, it's what effect does it have on the play and were you okay with it not working out whatsoever? Um, let's see. So when we're talking about whether a free hit or a regular hit in free play is raised and could be done so intentionally, we, we look for a number of things, okay? Repetition is a big one. So if a particular player, especially from a particular position, is raising the ball repeatedly, we're gonna take a dim view of that, especially when it's super advantageous for them. Because even though that ball may not be dangerous, it can be a lot harder to intercept. And I'm gonna get back to that interception difficulty point later because I think it's key to where I think this rule is, has shifted in the last uh, five years, something like that. Um, we also look for the raises that are happening in controlled situations. So we're looking for, you're more likely gonna be call, calling on a free hit uh, where the ball is stationary, at least under control of the player who's taking it and they're lifting it over and over again, okay? Classic 50 meter free hit out. I know that there are players even at the level I play at, which is terrible, that who can you know, put the ball up in the air somewhat. How high, how high, too high? We don't know. And it's advantageous to them. So at what point do we start saying, look, that's crazy. Another factor that we look at is the height of the ball. Now, I know we're not applying the danger rule in this situation, but at the end of the day, this is about danger because what we're saying is if players could intentionally raise hits all over the field, even when they're not shooting a goal, you would have more danger because players would be trying it and failing it and clocking people in the face and we don't want that. So we're trying to encourage with this rule, the skill of keeping the ball on the carpet and discouraging the attempt of intentionally putting a hit up into the air. So there's still very much a danger element of that. So the height of the ball is gonna come into play. That also has to do with how advantageous that hit's gonna be. So a hit that goes shin height or knee height isn't going to be considered as difficult to trap. That's something that we probably all as players had experience in attempting, whereas trying to trap a ball that isn't dangerous to us is going by, but it's going by shoulder height. We're going to, we're probably not going to be as good at that. Actually, those are the hits I love because I'm a tennis player. I was a tennis player when I was a kid. I talked about that in the last What Up Wednesday and uh, like that. Ooh, yeah. Give, give it to me. Hip height. Yeah. And I can, I can, pluck it out of the air with my stick. Uh, the only thing that I can do well in the field, by the way. Um, so, so that does, the, the height of the ball does come into play with that. And on that note of discouraging and encouraging certain skills, because it w is more likely to result in more dangerous play, in a broad sense, uh, I just finished an article for Hockey World News. It's going to come out soon. Jay Bloomfield has promised me it's coming out soon. And in it, I'm talking about Terry Walsh's uh, take on rule changes that he had uh, discussed in a conversation with Ashley Morrison of Not the Footy Show. And one of his ideas I thought was intriguing. And I don't mean intriguing as in I love it, but intriguing as in I think about it a lot because I think there's some merits, but I also see a lot of downsides is that he believes that we should be carding those 
accidentally raised balls that injure a member of the opposition, that hit them, that injure them, because that player has to go off the field, and then the player who has raised that hit dangerously, they just get a free hit against them. And in to view, that's not enough. That's not enough to discourage players from attempting that skill. So puzzling that over, uh, have a have a read of that article when it does come out and let me know what you think because I I'm still f fleshing that out in my brain of brains here. So let's go to some common scenarios where we see hits being raised where it could be intentional. Now, one of the classic ones Neil mentioned earlier is talking about, uh, you know, the reverse tomahawks that uh, that are taken out of the backfield, particularly defender under pressure. They don't have any passing lanes and they just, you know, clean the ball out and it's that desperation. So that's a time where we were clued in, hey, maybe this might be one of those intentional fouls. Um, that's, you know, uh, pretty common. Now, it, it, we, we see it also in other elements of the pitch, and maybe I should just go to the clip that I have. And in talking through this clip and all the issues around it, it'll help, you know, fill out what I'm uh, trying to talk about here. Let's see, I gotta go to here, and I gotta go to here. Okay, this is footage. You're gonna notice it's very grainy, and if it's hard to see, I, I apologize, but it's, uh, this is footage from the 2010 World Cup in Rosario. And uh, my friends Carolina Del Fuente and Relisa Roach are on the pitch for this one. And this match was between South Africa and Spain, a pool match. And you don't actually see the goal being scored here by Suzette Damons, but Suzette Damons, sorry, but she scored one of the most amazing goals of the year on that play. And what we see in the clip is there's just an example, just a little bit beforehand, where a defender takes that reverse tomahawk. Now, this tomahawk flew over players' heads, ended up going out of bounds inside the 23. So really free hit or sideline play probably has no difference whatsoever to the opposition. But then just if, about 20 seconds later, here's this attempt that goes through the midfield and ends up in a goal. Here are the things that you've got to consider about that particular play. And I'm just gonna keep rolling it so you guys can keep watching it as I'm talking. The pass is initiated outside the 23. There is video referral at this tournament, but the pass starts outside the 23, so it cannot be legally referred. Now, you can see from the body language that Carol's giving as she and Lisa are talking about it, is Carol's uh, trying to um, explain to uh, Rochi that she thinks that that ball has advantageously cleared over those players' heads. And the way that it plops down right at the attacker so beneficially should be construed as an intentionally raised hit. And it was really <laughs> way back in 2010, I was on a field hockey forum and we had a multi-page forum conversation, this one decision, which was very polarizing. It was like Republicans and Democrats arguing it out. And <laughs> I mean, whatever side I was on one, obviously. But what happened was there were a lot of people who wanted to stick with, well, it was advantageous, so you've got to blow that down. And for me, and the way that we were being briefed at that point in time, in 2010, it's not enough. So let me explain. And I know exactly where Kara was coming from in that particular play because she and I had been at a tournament in Kazan. It was a World Cup qualifier in Kazan early that year where we were specifically briefed on this point. Keep in mind that at the same time as all this is happening, it is still not legal to play the ball above your shoulder. That's key. It's absolutely key here. So we were told 
that a high clearance above heads that players can't legally attempt to play, if they did so, it would have been probably a yellow card for the breakdown, an upgrade if it happened inside the 23 or inside the circle. So big penalty for that play. And we all remember those days, those weren't fun. Um, and we, and, and we know from that experience now that players can play the ball over their shoulders. Was it 2012? Somebody dig into the old rule books. I can't remember exactly when that came into effect. 2013, maybe rule book. So we're now in a position today where players can pluck all out of the air there. And we've seen it happen. The last thing that you want to kind of consider when you're trying to process whether these balls are being raised intentionally is can players at any level of play and at the level of play that you're specifically umpiring, can they make mistakes? And this was one of the most polarizing points in the discussion on the forum at the time, because all the umpires, none of whom were international umpires, were saying, well, those are international players and they don't make mistakes. They can hit the ball flat. They can do all these things perfectly and every time. So if they're attempting a reverse tomahawk and it raises, they must have intended to do that because they know that that's going to be the best play. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I mean, I have umpired, I had at the time of my retirement, umpired every single team in the top 30 in the world, aside from the Dutch. I still have dreams about that. And I saw all of the players making skill mistakes under pressure. Even sometimes not when they were under pressure. Miss traps, miss hits poor decisions, all those kinds of things. That's why it's sport, right? That even as you get because of the speed, the tempo, your your fitness levels, getting exhausted, exhausted on the pitch, making all these calculations, taking risks that other people, will, your opposition will make mistakes, all of these things come into it. And there's all of these com compounding pressures on players and they do make mistakes. It, they miss fire on their skills. And sure, reverse hits had been around for a little while in 2010, but they weren't ridiculously, like they weren't as ubiquitous as they are today. They still were in kind of limited circulation and players were screwing them up fairly regularly. And, and I used that, I, I kept that example in that same clip of the defender, you know, turfing off and like completely misfiring it off the pitch you know if she meant to do that well i think there's easier ways to force a sideline hit for the opposition <laughs> you know so i don't like that idea and i don't think that's fair to players at all and when we looked at this particular play let me go back to it now And let's see if I can go to this specific angle where you see, I think it's this right here. Okay, so when you look at this, the player who's passing the ball has looked up, she's seen, she's got her left wing is wide open, <laughs> nobody within anywhere of her. And there is a lane straight ahead if she can just get it through that lane. So to say that she needed to tomble the ball over the heads in order to get to that attacker, I just don't think that's, that's valid. You can see that her head downs at this point. And as she hits the ball, some people might argue that that's dangerous. I mean, the Spanish player did jump up in the air, but that's because she thought the ball was actually gonna go under her feet and out to the left wing instead of straight through that lane. And then there's another attacker applying pressure. This, this passer is under a ton of pressure right here. It is late in the game. They're playing halves right now. And it's tied at this point. This is the winning goal that goes in. So if you're gonna tell me that the passer intended to chip this over people's heads 
it doesn't actually go through their heads. It doesn't, it doesn't go over heads. It goes like in between, you know, more like head, shoulder height. Doesn't go over. Cause and if you think that she needed to do that in order to score that goal, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of validity to that. I don't see that in the evidence. So, um, let's see. Simon here is just asking quickly, uh, maybe Carl was saying as a back stick because of the looping trajectory. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, it was a hot topic in our, in, in, in the FH empires communities right now, because, or at that point, because there were quite a few happening because reverse sticks were being used a lot more, but the, the reverse stick hit was being used a lot more. And we had the combination of the not being able to play the ball over the shoulder. So there was a movement afoot in the umpiring committee to encourage us umpires to crack down, as it were, and, and try to reduce the number of times that this was happening in a game. Because if you go too far one way, then, you know, the horse gets let out of the barn and all of a sudden everybody's chipping balls all over the field. And we're back to, I guess, 1950s hockey. I guess that legal back then. So I hope that sort of outlines the things that I think you should be looking for. You want to look for a clear advantage that wouldn't have been there but for the ball being raised. You want to look at um, whether a player could have trapped that ball at that skill level. Now, I was thinking about this, and one of the reasons that I went back to a 2010 clip on this is, I mean, I've been clipping matches for three years, very steadily. I've, I've watched probably every broadcast FH match over the last two years, and I have seen very few of these happening anymore. If it's not dangerous, it gets plucked down because the number of times that a player might intentionally be okay with firing that ball high and trying to get over players' heads is matched by the skill levels of the defenders. And I think that that equals out no matter what level of play that you're at. So if you're umpiring at my city level in the league that I play in, for example, it, no player is gonna be able to intentionally raise the ball like that. We just don't have that kind of control. But if they do on those very rare occasions and it isn't dangerous, then I think that at the same level, a defender is going to, an opposite player is going to have a, a decent opportunity of plucking that out of the air. And if they don't have a decent opportunity of plucking that air because it's going absolutely like nowhere near anybody, it's not disadvantageous. So you're not going to step in and intervene. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, let's see what Ingborg says. Thanks for adding to in this situation, in this discussion. It's important. If she sees the lane, the ball's at a controllable reachable distance. And then the balls travel a bit. Absolutely, right? This is, for me, this is a mis-execution of the skill. And I personally think it's important that we allow, as, as an umpiring community, as an umpiring family, the third team, that we are allowing players to make mistakes, to develop their skills. The game will not evolve if we're constantly stepping and saying, Psh, no, you can't try that because you screwed it up before or something on the, along that theme. I, I don't like that whatsoever. We're there to, our whole modus operandi is to try to have the, provide an environment where the teams and the players can play their best hockey possible. And in order to do that, that means that they need to be able to take chances and take risks and occasionally make mistakes. That of course is tempered by danger concerns, right? Because we still, we're balancing that with the safety of the players. So if safety is not the primary issue, and if it's not a secondary or tertiary issue, because we're not worried about this creeping into the game more and more often as uh, an attempted skill, I don't see why we would call that. Let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's see. What was the call? <laughs> that's, that's a good, that was a good question. Um, so what ended up happening is as 
very, very long story. But as Roach and Carol were discussing it in the middle, they were, you know, trying to work out what was happening. Of course, there's communication issues. And first of all, the Spanish team wanted to refer the pass. And they can't because it's outside the 23. So as soon as that was communicated to them, they then said that they wanted to they wanted to refer the actual goal and say that the goal was dangerous um, or that the attacker had played the ball above her shoulder. I can't exactly remember which way that went, but they, they referred the So that immediately took the call out of the purview of the two pitch umpires for that portion. It got interrupted and hey, maybe now in 2020, because we've worked through the video review rules more and more, umpires would say, look, you know, don't refer, we're gonna work this out. And maybe they would have gotten to the conclusion that they would have disallowed the goal. I hope not. And I think pretty clear that if, that, that Rochi saw the play and she was happy with it. It wasn't like she was unsighted or anything else. So she made her judgment. It's coming into her circle. It's her primary control. Carol saw it differently. That's totally fair as well. But would that have that conversation have changed Rochi's mind? And would they have called goal off? I don't know. But they got interrupted by the Spanish referring the actual goal scoring contact. And there was nothing wrong with that. Goal was upheld. Uh, South Africa won the game. And Spain, I think, finished really low in that tournament. It really started to push them down the list and then they, in the pool standings and then they crossed over and yeah, I, th I think it affected them quite, you know, negatively. And that was, that was their tournament as it went. Um, let's see, Paul, what do you got for? Me? So as a one-off and safe, no foul, but if there's a trend from the same player team that think along the lines of it being deliberate or foul, if it was dangerous, obviously foul. Yes. I. I think that's the way you want to go. Now, you are the one in your games. You know though that you're umpiring at. You've either done your homework or you have years of experience. You know what players are capable of at that level. So you're going to be the best person to, to know how you're going to call this at the moment, okay? But these are the things that I want you to put into your brain process so that when you're in that situation, you're going to look at, okay, what do I usually see these players do? Are they trying something that's a bit outside their zone? Have they tried this before during the game and it's not worked out or it raised, it worked out really well for them. So maybe they're like, Hey, I kind of like this result. I'm going to do this again because what's the problem? I'm not hitting it dangerously. So I don't care. That starts lending itself more into intention. Okay. One of the things that I like to do again with a lot of these very gray subjective areas, it's nothing wrong with having a conversation with a player. If there's one player who gets to, you know, who's, who's chipping it up about, you know, waist height off those 50 meter free hits. The first time they do is say, okay, that wasn't dangerous, but I don't want to see that more often because I'm going to think you meant to do that. That's a line that I've used that tends to nip it right in the bud. Because if if they if they chip it and they didn't mean to, they'll they'll right away they'll turn to you and go, whoa, no, I totally didn't mean that one. That was a total mess up. Somebody else is gonna take it. So you win. <laughs> you get the result that you want. So I hope that kind of wraps that all up for you. Anything else for that? Let me know. I'm still looking. Still looking at the comments. What did I miss earlier? Kumar is asking a whole bunch of uh, technical questions. Let's see. What did you say, Lockie? A raised hit not dangerous should be called if the team lifted gain an advantage. Yeah. So that's okay. That's a good start. But it's not just about an advantage. Because if you don't, if you just say, oh, well, that really, you were super lucky on that. You can't call luck. I don't think that's fair to the players. I think that's over, be, that's being overly efficient. So don't just look at whether it was advantageous. That absolutely is one thing because if nobody is disadvantaged, you're not gonna call anything, period. You might just have a side word. 
look at repetition, look at was that the only way that they could get the ball there? Look at the skill levels of players. And what I think you're really going to find these days is because players can play above their shoulder, you don't see it happening as often. You just don't. Like, I couldn't clip any. I didn't find any. I would have gone, whoa, I think that one should have been called. Because as soon as I see something like that, my gut goes, whoa, I think that should have been called. I'm like instantly in there with, with the clip, so. All right. Let's see what happens, Meg. What do you got for me? In high school games, any raised hits between the 23s are called, even if no danger is posed. And let's be honest, if any of my girls could do that intentionally, right? So I'm not sure what kind of climate that builds on the pitch. How does how do players feel about those being called? How do, how does that help with the skill of evolution and the development? Because it's one thing to hit those balls in practice. It's a whole nother thing to do it in a game when you're being chased under pressure. There's tons of stuff that I have learned how to do over the last six months of shutdown that I'm fairly certain that when, if I ever get back to playing, I'm not gonna be able to do a game because I'll be under pressure and I haven't been able to, to train with that, to train with other people giving me pressure. Yeah, and not even if, but even when. Oh, God, it's rough, girl. I feel ya. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to topic two. I think, and yes, here's the result, Meg saying they get so stupid. Yeah, I would too. I get really pissed. And if that is the, if that's what's building up, if that's the emotion, the feeling, how are you as an umpire fulfilling your duty? Like, how are you serving the game by being a police person? It's, it, 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 you, I, I, I can't, I can't get behind that. I can't. I wouldn't want to be that person. I wouldn't want to be that umpire myself. And I'm not going to encourage other umpires to do that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to show this really quickly. This came through a little while back, uh, like weeks ago. And I always meant to put it up because I thought it was hilarious. But I put this thing up on my website where you could um, or you go and, and answer this question. What's the biggest umpiring problem we can help you solve? And this person, anonymous, just said, timing. Help me with timing. I missed your webinar. That was adorable. Very, very cute. Okay, so before I move on to the to the next question, I just want to talk really quickly. Um, uh, I like to reintroduce everybody to the fact that I have the FH Empire's third team going on on the website. This is my program where I am offering, you know, the clip library up uh, when you start at the green level of membership, where I've put all the clips and all the explanations up. You can search. You can filter you can comment you can get straight access to me and have a dialogue about what you're seeing and what kind of crazy stuff i'm talking about so if you're having a problem with intentionally raised hits you're having a problem with uh aerials going into the d you can go there and you can feed your eyeballs with a whole bunch of clips and get onto that and i was thinking about this in particular a few days ago because i'm terror uh, my good friend Bernardo Fernandez of Self Pass wrote something about, you know, the professionalism lack thereof and the business or lack thereof in hockey as a sport. And I basically said something to the fact that I, I find it really frustrating that we, because we consider ourselves an amateur sport, we confine ourselves to being an amateur sport. And we need to get past that as a game. We, we expect to get into high level matches for nothing as spectators. We expect not to pay for streams online and expect amazing quality regardless. We expect not to pay because when we play for them and we take training from them, we expect umpires to umpire for free. <laughs> um, we expect our education for free. And the pandemic's been a really interesting kind of confounding factor on that in that a whole bunch of people especially in our sport just piled online and there was webinar after webinar and I mean I did it too 
I absolutely was part of this where I was offering all this value and I'm still going to do it because at the end of the day, this is just a fraction of what I've got packed into my brain, kids. Like I have got so much stuff I want to share with you. Uh, so I'm not scared about giving all this away. This is absolutely, you know, amazing and building and rewarding and, and valuable. But at the same time, if our sport's going to survive and we're going to be able to compete against football, against cricket, against basketball and American football and all those other sports that I care absolutely nothing about, except for ice hockey a little bit, but that's waning too. But if we're going to compete with all those big sports, we have got to get our heads wrapped around the concept of paying for value. And that means that you as umpires should be paid for your time and your expertise to go out there. Your coaches should be getting properly remunerated for their time and their expertise and what they're giving you. Because the if we can make this more professional and more of a business, we are going to be able to offer a better product to participate in, to contribute to as a coach, umpire, administrator, all those things. We're going to offer a better product to fans so that fans are going to actually want to watch this game because we're taking it to the next level, the next level, the next level. So if you're thinking like, oh, you know, I'm getting so much out of all this stuff, please think about it. Go to FHU3T.com. The blue membership is like a patronage and it's $3 American a month. And if you contribute to that, you will be helping make sure that I can keep doing this for everybody for all eternity, because this is what I want to do. I don't want to ever sit in a desk job. I just want to talk about umpiring all the time. Anyway, that's my rant. Let's move on to the next topic. It's 1244. Whew. Oh boy. We are definitely not getting through three. I'm such a Muppet. I should know better. Okay. Lockie, we're getting to your, getting to your jam here. We are talking about the probable goal on the penalty stroke. I can hear rust rustling behind me. I think my part is coming home. Okay. Whoops. Wrong screen. Let's go to the iPod split. Okay. We are talking about this rule here, 12.4 and it's a, we're going to talk about the unintentional foul in the circle, which prevents the probable scoring of a goal. So Lockie brought this up because he wanted to wait, here it is. He wanted to go over, especially about this word probable and what it really means. So he starts off saying nice things about me. Thank you. And, uh, I'm really envious that you've been able to get back to real hockey. Congrats. <laughs> and he wanted to put out for discussion that a better use, a, a better word than probable would be say something like imminent, that an unintentional foul stops an imminent goal from being scored. So first off, if you have been in a situation where you have been considering calling a penalty stroke, but you're not sure if it was a probable goal or not, tell me in the comments and we'll talk about it because I don't, it, it's actually kind of rare that you get a situation where you're not really all that sure. Of course, because a penalty stroke is such a high probability scoring situation itself, you only award them when you feel certain that that same level of opportunity got taken away by the foul, right? Scales of justice that I talk about all the time, you're looking for the equilibrium, you're looking for the balance point. And if you're not sure that you should put that much on those weights of scales, you don't want to go like that. So you're you'll defer to a penalty corner and say, Hey guys, I'm just not sure that was a probable goal. So when I look at the dictionary definition of probable, as I like to do, it's likely to be the case or to happen. And so it's likely going to be happening. Well, what the hell is 
likely. And actually, I, I included this little thing about just down at the bottom here, the difference between possible and probable. And that if something's possible, it could happen, but if something's probable, it's likely to happen. Okay. What the hell does likely mean? Well, thanks Wikipedia for giving me this. So this is fascinating. There was a guy named uh, Sherman Kent. He was an intelligence analyst. And back in 1964, he invented a paradigm that wasn't adopted by the intelligence uh, analyst community, but it should have been, according to this Wikipedia article, probably written by him, that uh, you can actually define uh, probabilities and you're taking the art of the word, the, the poetry as he described it, and you're marrying it with a mathematical, a statistical certainty, and you're bringing them together and sort of matching up what the poetry of the word means and then the actual statistical thing. I'm a handsy talker today. And this is the paradigm he developed that he wanted to be adopted. Now think about intelligence, anal, an, uh, intelligence and analyst analysis, you're talking about, say, potential terrorist attacks, and you're trying to decide whether you're going to take a proactive or prophylactic step uh, as against something that could happen. Is a probable event likely imminent, all the sort of things. And this is this is the uh, index he came up with probable is 75% likely, give or take about 12%. So that's a pretty wide range. There you go. Um, yeah, Meg's saying it's like a storm warning versus storm watch. Exactly. Like, what do the what does the art of these terms mean? But I like that seventy five percent. Feels pretty good. I'm kind of like, I'd say more like an eighty percent. And I think that your probability is going to go up according to like your your threshold for what your percentage is. Is going to be higher when the proficiency of penalty stroke takers is higher because if they're going to score 99 percent of the time i think you kind of want to be 80 percent 85 percent but if they miss sometimes or they duff it or something like that you can you can lower that down to about 75 percent does that make sense it's like again you're equalizing for levels of skill and proficiency and let's contrast that with the word imminent. For example, imminent is about to happen. Sounds very certain. The whole problem with an unintentional foul that stops the scoring of a goal is that you don't know what could have happened. You can't just like continue to roll the tape and find out because the butterfly effect, boom, something's happened and everything changes. So you're, you're kind of done. And if that is the level of certainty that you need to achieve, you're, you're going to be struggling. Um, another definition, ready to take place, happening soon, often used for something bad or dangerous, seen as menacingly near. It's imminent. <laughs> so I like that. The thought of a, you know, most goalkeepers would say that if a goal is imminent, that's a very bad thing. So let's, let's look at a couple clips that I have. Uh, these are fun because they are not imminent goals they are maybe goals this is england and malaysia and sam ward whacks that out of the air with that uncanny uh, uh hand-eye coordination he has and you can see the malaysian defenders are really unhappy about this penalty stroke award and i think that's is that Tim Bond? Somebody tell me. Anyway, this is the Commonwealth Games, and he's made the stroke decision. Now, you can see that from a horizontal perspective, lateral perspective, that the goalkeeper is still behind, but he's off to the side of the defender who gets struck. Now, when you look at that angle, and I'll try to play just that segment a couple more times. Okay, this is about where it hits him. That's not a big margin from where the goalkeeper's toe is going 
and the ball striking the defender. So obviously the Malaysian defenders are arguing, goalkeeper's behind, he could have made that save. Well, he could have, but was he going to? Was there a 25% chance or more than a 25% chance that that goalkeeper is going to make that save? I think the 75% threshold is met with that decision. And that's okay with me. I think that's the right balance. But if that doesn't feel right to you, I mean, let me know if you think that that was a little bit different. Let's look at another one, though, that was a little bit more controversial, and I'm not picking on any of the umpires that were involved with this situation because it was a very difficult game. If it's too loud, let me know. This is at Euros last year. Scotland Ireland, big derby. First call is for a stroke for hitting the defender with an unintentional foul. So the first argument comes from a Scottish defender, Captain Alan Forsyth, who says that the defender, the defender is in front of the goalkeeper, the goalkeeper is behind, so it shouldn't have been a stroke, and he wants a penalty corner. And then Andres gets over the radio from Jonas that it actually hit the attacker's hand, so it's a free hit out. This is a schmazel. This is no fun at all. And I don't envy anybody on this one. So now there's an argument as to whether Ireland can take a referral. Ireland does take a referral, and they say it hit the hand, but it wasn't an intentional use of the hand. The hand was part of the stick, or it didn't hit the hand at all. And it hit the defender's body. We want the penalty corner. So the referral goes up, and now they are talking. Okay, we'll go back to the evaluations of the other stroke, or the other, yeah, the other stroke decision in a second because I appreciate that input. I'd like to see that. So now it's gone up to referral, and remember now. Oh, this is very interesting. I'm black. And so the first thing that Bruce, as the video umpire, looks at is where does the ball contact the attacker? And he's happy with that where the contact point is was not a foul. And then he looks at all the angles and he comes to the termination on this one that it's going up into the Scottish player's body. The Scottish player is down on the ground, taking up some space. Where is the defender? All this kind of stuff. And let's see if there's one. I think there's one more angle that really helps us have a look at this. Why this was such a difficult decision. So Bruce comes back with a penalty stroke on this. For him, he believed it was a probable goal and that the threshold of around 75% was met with this one. So I'm hoping that we will see, no, that's the actual stroke. And okay. So this is the kind of angle we're looking at is was that ball going by the having a good chance, a probable chance, a 75% chance of going by the goalkeeper there? And this is where your comments here are really interesting here. Um, and Dave is talking about the other one that the player was in the way of the keeper getting there. And as a retired goalkeeper, Caroline's saying that the goalkeeper was already stretched out. And so it wasn't like they could have stretched even further in that millisecond that was proceeding. And Nick, if the goalkeeper gets anything on it, uh, it still would have gone in in that last scenario. So now how does that apply to this? Does it look the same to you or not? And so it's 
it's very it's very interesting that you need to make that kind of you could get in that situation where you're making that kind of judgment call and very difficult. I'm actually quite surprised that this came back as a stroke. And when you listen to the players and what they're looking for and what they're arguing about, the words used by the Irish player who asked for the referral was they wanted a penalty corner. So I'm not saying that their evaluation of a situation is determinative, but it's informative. It's a piece of information that you can take because from their angles, which are different angles than what you have when you're on your pitch, that's what they saw. Maybe that's information you want to take into account. Okay. Um, Luke, difficult decision for all involved. Absolutely. Need a camera angle from the primary umpire's viewpoint. Yeah, that probably would have helped. Let me just see if I can scroll back. Because this is, this is actually... Okay, so this is the angle I think that sold Bruce on the penalty stroke is that the Scottish goalkeeper, Tommy Alexander, he's down. His left guard is left leg, leg guard, fully down on the ground. He's, he's there. Scottish defender is to the side and at the angle where it's going, I think Bruce believes that even though the goalkeeper is behind him, the goalkeeper is down and the ball is going to go over his leg guard. And he's making the calculation that at the angle it was going, it would go into the net and not say over it. So, boy, that is, that's a tough one. But these are all the things that you're going to want to think about. Uh, yep. Difficult, difficult for Nick. Possible, not probable. So looking at where the other defender was, if you've got video review, you get to make assumptions because you can roll it back and you can freeze it like I have here. And you can say, mm, okay, well, if the ball is going at this angle and it gets stopped, had it not been stopped, it would have kept going. And this is the angle at which it was proceeding and at this pace and blah, blah, blah. So that's where it would have ended up. That second Scottish defender on the line, there's no way they would have been anywhere near that ball. So it's like a, the goalkeeper is further off to the side as well. Like that, the, that, that defender is out of play. So I don't think we need to really look at them. And uh, yeah, Graham making the point that uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, on the umpires from the players. Yeah, absolutely. It was a schmozzle. And that's why it's really important the way that you set up these difficult situations and these confrontations is that you don't want to get yourself in the, in the position where you're doing things in isolation and you're disorganized about it. So the first thing that should happen was it, when he's getting that information, he's getting a request for a referral, is that why not get together and have the conversation? This is what I saw. And then you can confirm it and then you can present that to the captains and then none of us are going to be in the position of asking or needing to go to a video referral, but then the players can make their election and then a player can say, okay, on those grounds, I'm going to make a video referral. And then you can, you can separate and you can do all those things, but take your time with these tough ones. You don't have to rush. Interesting point. Nick says, I think there's so much discussion here. Now it means it can't be probable by definition. Well, yeah, that's a good point. I guess what I'm saying is I can see where Bruce is coming from. When you look at this and you look at the angle that it's it's chipping up into the air and the Scottish player is taking up, uh, the defender is taking up the position to block the goal and their stick isn't anywhere in play. Um, the goalkeeper is down, all that kind of stuff. I can see it, but this is not, I think, a 75% decision you can reach at any other level where you don't have the ability to freeze this frame. Thomas, what do you have for me? Oops, let's try this again. Does the ball need to be pushed shot towards goal? What about a ball passed to an attacker alone in front of an empty goal and stopped by fault of a defender? Oh, that's a tough one. Now, 
I think in that case, you're still not getting to 75% because there's too much that can still happen with that attacker who's alone. That's, that is, that would be a call with immense ovaries. Like if you could get away with that, all right, all right. But I think you're gonna have a tough sell on it. I think you'd be in a much better position when you've got a pass being stopped that's going to an attacker who's alone who would absolutely imminently score that goal. Is that an intentional foul? <laughs> like, I'd, I'd be wondering, right? And we're talking about a hypothetical that we don't have any visual information for. Get it? So there you go. Um, let's see. Any other comments on that? Look at where Alexander's left hand pad, I guess. That's what that means. Okay, I'm going to go back to it just quickly because I don't want to see it. Who's opened it up to... Yeah, it's the That's hand. Offhand. And okay, but guys, I do think I'm going to be Alexander looking to see where that yeah. It was also really interesting because Davy Hart yeah, was guesting in okay, the commentary with so uh, Simon there. And Davy Hart, as an Irish player, said, Woo, that's a tough one for a penalty stroke. I'm, I'm happy it was awarded, but I don't feel it. Yeah, Ian, I see your point with the left hand protector that there's the potential. Again, he's kind of, he's falling back. It's going behind him. I don't know. Tommy went on, on Twitter and he expressed his opinion about the call. He had that save the whole way, so he was not happy. I get it. And yeah, at the end of the day, <laughs> Lockie here is saying that I'm a Google ninja finding a percentage matrix for English words. This is my life, okay? I am the biggest nerd. Yes, P for protector. Thank you, Ian. I got it. <laughs> it takes me a while. My brain doesn't, I'm not as good at verbalizing as I would like to be. I'm very good at writing things down because I get to delete things. There you go. And yes, uh, Simon, that's a great point. Two goalkeepers in the commentary box and neither of them felt a penalty stroke was in the offing. So anyway, so that's all of the things, right? And so what isn't important is what was correct in that case. What is important is if you look at all these things, what percentage do you get to? And Lucky, I hope that kind of explored why I think probable is actually a good term for this situation. Um, I hope that they don't ever do anything silly like put 75% in the rule book because then we're we're absolutely, you know, like there's no way that's gonna just specificity is the enemy of perfection. Tweet that. Just made it up on the fly. I'm going to put that in an Insta, Instagram post. So getting that specific in a regimented way is not going to help us, but that might be uh, a good sort of measure. Um, there was one comment I wanted to go back to in uh, when you said that we don't want to look at the proficiency. Surely our decision to award a PC or penalty stroke should have nothing to do with your perception of how good the stroke taker is. Not specifically, no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the level of play. I'm talking about how our team penalties have to match what has been taken away. And you do, you absolutely do have to take that. That is the whole understanding what the players are trying to achieve and what they can achieve. And if you are gonna balance the scales of justice appropriately in a particular situation, in a particular game, you have to take that into account, I believe. I think that's good on par. You may think that it needs to be more standardized and black and white and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I get it. I just don't think that leads to better decision making. I think that puts you in a box and you end up making decisions that, well, it's technically correct, but it feels like shit for that game. And I don't like those calls. That's me. Um, 
<laughs> ah, there you go. Lucky, I've won you over. He says, I like 75%. Now I will no longer say I will probably go to the gym today. <laughs> that means that if you say it 75% of the time, you got to go. There you go. All right. Uh, I am over time. Uh, but this was an awesome session and I really enjoyed the back and forth. It really helped me explain myself better. I need these questions. I need these lines of inquiry. They really do force me to go through my own reasoning and make sure that it's solid. So thank you for that. And if you're still, you've got things that you want me to, to continue processing with you, if there's things that I've missed that you think are going to change the way that we look at this, I want to hear that too. Absolutely. This is how we generate consensus and better umpiring, I think. So thank you so much for joining in. And I hope it was informative as always. We are going to be talking, first topic next week is going to be how to tackle well in 3D skills. That's for uh, Maddie, uh, Maddie Gao, I think. Uh, Meg, there you go. That's one thing that's up for next week. We might talk stick blocks next week. I'm not sure. But maybe I'm just going to go with two topics. <laughs> and they're this big because clearly it's taking me too long to talk about them. Uh, Nick, you're very welcome. It's nice to have you on board and in the third team. It's, it's been fun to meet you and correspond with you. And thank you very much, Mr. Milford, for the interior design stuff. <laughs> uh, I really enjoy it. Oh, George, it was good to see you too. Thanks for joining in. And if you have something that you want me to talk about, something pressing, something that happened in your game, something that's been buzzing around in your brain, then drop me a line. You can comment on this on Facebook. You can hit me on YouTube and try to drown out all the porn spam that I get there. Uh, you can tweet at me, you can DM me, you can go to my website and you can actually click on a button and you can send me a text on WhatsApp. I am that available because it's a pandemic. I don't have friends anymore. I, you guys are my best friends. So keep sending me messages. I love hearing it all. You're very welcome, Jim. It was great to see you as well. <laughs> and, and let's see, another great hour or so of FH Empires, probably. <laughs> oh, God, you got me. So good. And you're very welcome, Devon Empires, my favorites. Great to see you all. And uh, keep a lookout for, remember, there's uh, Umpire at Home highlights. That's coming out tomorrow. Uh, a feature Friday, which is a clip from the clip library that uh, we go through. And I'm just going to keep up the posts because it's been fun. We will see you next week and stay safe. And if you're going out to play hockey this weekend or umpire hockey, even better, please stay safe, look after yourselves and let me know how it goes. See you next week. Bye.